All right. Welcome back to Getting Past the Premium, everybody, with Ryan and I today. Ryan, you're back. What's up, man? I am. It's been a while. I'm it happy to be here. It's good to see you. And, uh, with uh, us today, we have Sean Brooks. Sean, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Elliot and Ryan, wonderful to be with you. Excited to have a, a conversation with you here today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. I think you're going to provide a really good perspective for a lot of our listeners out there. But just to set the stage, why don't you kind of give everybody the the background on who you are, what you do today, um, and then we'll we'll jump in. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, so currently, I work with a firm called Buckingham Strategic Partners. I'm the divisional manager for the central region of the United States. And really what that means is I'm working with uh, the top RAA uh, firms across the Midwest, helping them in a number of different ways, not only with things like investments in back office and technology, but just thinking about the scalability of their enterprise, their enterprise value, the client experience they're delivering, and really all the ways that they're making an impact from a financial planning perspective for the clients that they serve. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. I think what you do on a regular basis is a lot of what we talk about, you know, firms needing to do in the risk management side of the industry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's all, it's all one big conversation, but I think it's important that we recognize where the financial services industry has gotten versus where we're at with the risk management industry. Um, and Ryan, I don't know if you have any perspective on that being in the financial services side, but. Yeah, we talked about that a lot, right? About, I don't, I don't necessarily know why I have uh, thoughts around why the financial services industry is uh, more advanced, if you will, than the risk management space in terms of how advice is delivered and how they've made this transition from being more transactional to more holistic and um, advisory base. But regardless, Sean, I, I look, I've, I've been looking forward to this conversation. I think you bring a unique perspective when it comes to working with a bunch of different advisors across the country. And I think there's a lot that can be gleaned from your experience by being in these folks' shops and, you know, taking best practices and things out of those to make everybody else better. So, I mean, I, if you don't mind, I'd kind of like to start just around the service side, of, or I should say experience side of things. You mentioned that uh, in your intro and, you know, we're in, in the risk management space in particular right now, it's very difficult from a market standpoint. We're going through massive rate increases. Uh, companies are continue continuing to be you know, non-renewed and having to go out into the marketplace and find new insurance carriers to, um, you know, represent these businesses and whatnot. And uh, it's tough from an advisor's perspective dealing with all of that. Very similarly in, in, in the financial services space where, you know, the market's down 20, 30 percent, like what you say and what you deliver from a client experience matters. So, with that being said, like, um, kind of walk us through what you've been seeing lately from a client experience perspective on the wealth management side of the business that's been helping, you know, elevate relationships on your end. Yeah, I think that's the key word there, relationships, right? I mean, that drives everything, especially in the financial advisory space, right? Getting to know the potential client, understanding their, their vision, their values, their goals, really what they're trying to accomplish that's outside of just uh, the commas and, and decimal points that they have on their statements, right? So it really does come down to relationships. And those relationships can sustain for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, depending on if you're helping children and the next generation. So having that personal connection and developing that relationship is, is key to everything related to the client experience. Now, there are a lot of different layers to the client experience and happy to kind of dig into those different things. But I don't know if you've ever read or have heard of Dennis Mosley Williams uh, or the book, uh, The Experience Economy. Yeah. Just thinking about, you know, what are we really providing, right? Is it a service versus an experience? Now, one comes at a premium in terms of what people are willing to pay for, right? Dennis likes to use the old Starbucks analogy. analogy. You go in there, that's more than just a cup of coffee, right? So if we think about how this might translate to either the risk management business or the wealth management business, whatever the case might be, 
the successful advisors that I'm working with are really thinking more than just, hey, can we do the basics? It's can we do the basics, do them really, really well, but then keep bringing more to the table. And that experience is uh, all encompassing and can range outside of financial topics um, very broadly. So just in a nutshell, that's kind of what I'm seeing and happy to dig into that a little bit more. I think there's a lot to chat through in terms of what that client experience can mean, how to deliver it efficiently, keep that level of personalization and kind of uniqueness for each individual family that you're serving. Yeah, I'd love to dive into it deeper. And it's it's so crazy, the correlation between the two industries, if you will, because like I'd summarize what you just said a little bit into like value compression, mm -hmm. right? It's like they thought fee compression was going to start happening in the wealth management space. We haven't necessarily seen that, but it, it certainly has been like, what else are you doing for me? And in the risk management space, like, commissions are set at the carrier level like we don't have any control over our income and fee structure from that perspective so it literally becomes a a, a conversation around can we provide can we be doing more can we provide more to our clients for the same revenue and how do we do that um in these markets but yeah i'd love to have you continue to dive down that path between, you know, the difference between service and experience. Yeah. And service and experience are, are two elements of, you know, what a client perceives, but they are intertwined, of course, but they are different, right? I think about service and, and just in terms of reducing the friction that a client may have, whether that be on a transactional side or, you know, even if, if it's a request that comes in from a client, let's say who, you know, needs funds out of their investment portfolio, whatever the case might be. The service aspect is based around responsiveness, being able to execute on an order, whatever that could be, right, regardless of the industry. And again, reducing that friction that the client has. They have some sort of pain point or need. Can you solve it? Can you solve it efficiently? Mm -hmm. The next step then is how do we turn client service into a good client experience? And that requires professionals to think forward and say, let's proactively identify what that next challenge might be. And while I'm in the midst of this service issue, the original reason you called or reached out, I can look forward and say, hey, to help deliver a better experience for you, I know that this is going to be that next issue you're going to face. Let's also address that as well. And that puts customers in the situation where they, they reach out for one thing, but then they're getting additional support. And man, that really elevates that experience and the feeling of, oh, they're really taking care of me and thinking about me in different ways if they're able to, able to kind of look forward above and beyond what my original request was. That's so I think sense. that separating service and experience is important, but again, they are intertwined. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in the risk management space, there's um, some thoughts and right people in the industry have, you know, it's all transaction based. And I think in the financial advisory space, there are some uh, feelings from clients as well that, you know, they're just collecting X percent on my dollars and really don't care about me. Right. So it's mm -hmm. always for financial advisors about bridging that gap of, What's the perceived value and what am I actually delivering and do they match up? And I think that can be a difficult task for advisors sometimes who, you know, know a lot of the work that they're doing to help clients, but do their clients actually feel that? Are they delivering it to clients in a way where it's front and center on a continual basis to eliminate some of that shadow work that goes on in the background? Yeah, it's not I mean, enough to just tell the client anymore either. You're right. They have to feel it, experience it, see it. You know, yeah. know that you're doing things differently. Yeah, and that's a lot of education, a lot of touch points. Again, financial advisors, just like um, others in, in different industries, are providing a lot of value. But if the client doesn't see it, mm -hmm. it's free, right? If they don't feel it, if they don't know that you did something in the background for them, they don't know that they're actually paying for that, which I think is what helps kind of translate from a transactional relationship to more of a sustained value relationship where a client in, in the wealth advisory space is paying, you know, over very long periods of time. And as an advisor, you better be presenting that value in a way that the client can realize on a continual basis. Mm -hmm. Totally. Do, do you think that's a lot of times due to, we just assume that the client knows what we're doing? You know, I, I feel that a lot where we need to, you know, on the risk management side, you know, we, a lot of times start that renewal process of doing a lot of work on the client's behalf, you know, three to four months ahead of their insurance renewal. 
And sometimes they don't even know that we're already working on it, you know, and they might be out looking for other options because they have no idea that we're working on it. So I don't know what your perspective. I feel like we just assume that they might know that we're doing that work. I, I think that's that's very much so the case because as professionals, we sit on this side of the table. We all we know everything that goes into maintaining relationships and creating proposals and reviewing policies and whatever the case might be. But again, it goes down to the fact that if the client doesn't know those things are being done, if you're not communicating that out in a proactive way versus just waiting for the phone call of, I, th I think I'm up for renewal or, hey, we should be having a meeting this quarter, you're already behind the eight ball. Yeah. So it's about pre being proactive with communication, education on different topics, whatever the case might be, and really providing that client with a continual sense of calm. Because in our case, in the advisory world, that's one of the biggest things that can drive value in relationships is the fact that the client just sleeps better at night yeah. knowing things are taken care of by you, the professional. So there's a ton of value there. But again, if there's a disconnect, if their client isn't feeling that on a continual basis, that's when clients start to say, hey, maybe I should go to this other professional for something I need help with when, you know, maybe maybe that advisor or per point person on the risk management side could have easily handled that and addressed it in an easier way. Totally. Makes makes a ton of sense. So, <clears throat> Sean, how have you been able to help advisors understand, you know, what they're doing from a service perspective and mm -hmm. what they're doing well, but you know, that that's kind of table sticks, right? Like they have to reduce friction. They have to do those things. How have you been able to identify those? And then on the same hand with, the experience it's like okay well this is going over and beyond so we need to like look at that as an experience and try to make that better like what's been your experience walking into an advisor shop and looking at those and helping them kind of understand what they've been providing and like maybe it's just a function of highlighting that more and then oh well you do this this is over and beyond like put this in a little bit different light and your clients are going to get a different perceived value from that significant yeah, I think one exercise that I'll take advisors through is just asking the question of let's just pretend. Um, and again, going back to the financial advisory world, most clients are billed kind of in an ongoing basis on a quarterly kind of set schedule, right? So if we just do an exercise myself and the advisor and say, hey, let's say we were to turn off your, your automated quarterly billing for next quarter. And instead, you were to reach out to your clients and say, hey, there's no bill collected this quarter. But what we'd love you to do is send payment for whatever value you believed you received in the last 90 days for us, from us. <laughs> now, if, if that's not that automated money isn't being pulled out, all of a sudden that puts the client and say, hey, what did I what did I actually receive here? What am I getting? And if you kind of play that little game and, and kind of it, it makes the advisor or the business owner think introspectively of what are my clients actually getting? I know what I'm providing, but are they truly receiving it? And if and if might put a little pause or a little uh, skip of the heartbeat if they went through that and turned off their billing and said, just send me a payment for whatever you think the value is that we received in the last 90 days from us. That is a really good exercise to get advisors to say, man, a lot of my clients would send the full amount or maybe I wouldn't. And then kind of identify some trouble spots. And from there, you can think through, you know, what's the experience that different subsets of your clients actually are receiving? Are they getting the most value from the relationship? How are you delivering it? So you can kind of work backwards from there and say, like, this is really, really good. These are some areas that maybe you want to improve. But that kind of diagnostic is just one way to start that conversation. That's killer. Yeah, that's a great exercise to go through. That reminds me of the the Amazon starting to sell insurance, Ryan. You know, and if if they can do it at one percent and you're doing it at twelve percent, how yeah. what how are you going to show the client they should pay you eleven percent more? You know, that's going to happen at some point. You know, there and it already is to a degree, but yeah, and in the advisory space, there's just so much noise, right? Same as in risk yeah. management, there's all these different offerings, and clients are, you know, bombarded with the the price is lowest here, and we have the best service, and it gets very, very confusing. Mm -hmm. In the advisory space specifically, there are very large name firms out there that can offer basic portfolio management and oversight from a planning professional at an extremely low cost. Now, it's more of a call center. It's a little bit more of an automated experience. The difference between what those firms charge and what, you know, a true relationship and a real financial advisor can deliver, that delta there is essentially what clients are paying for. Yeah. It's that personal relationship and the fact that 
you aren't getting automated messages every month. It's more personalized, more tailored. And then again, that's where the thought of a client experience and being able to deliver that, that's what's so important. Because otherwise clients have so many options. If it's just a matter of price, you know, that becomes a really difficult market. Yeah. Which, you know, I think a goal for every one of us is to take it off of price. I mean, exactly. It is clearly a factor, but we don't want it to be the factor. Yeah, absolutely. They always say what cost is the issue. Cost is an issue uh, in the absence of value. There's, there's yeah. some great yeah. saying there that yeah. I just butchered, but you know, it's true. <laughs> I think you nailed it actually. Pretty, yeah, pretty something like that. Sounded good. If you just <laughs> yeah. would have rolled with it, nobody would have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. But it, it really is. Perception is reality, right? So if the client doesn't perceive that you're doing the work for them and there's really only one way to prove it and that's by showing it to them and communicating it, then they're just not going to get what they think they're paying for. Totally. Yeah. It's, uh, I want to bring in another variable here to the same conversation because, you know, that sounds simple enough, right? Like, uh, to kind of walk through an exercise and put yourself in that position to gauge how you're articulating the value to a client, but layer on like the right or the different types of client variable, if you will, right? Like how important is that in this same conversation? Because you can't deliver an experience or the same experience to seven different types of clients. Yeah, so in, in my world, we call that like client profiling or kind of a segmentation exercise. It's really just understanding what are the types of clients that are out there, who you're trying to serve, and, and what are the solutions that you can bring to them that may be unique across some different client profiles, and then really tailoring that offering to fit the needs of those different profiles, right? Because otherwise, again, you're just more of a generalist, and we all know, and when you become a generalist, it's very hard to charge a premium. When you become a specialist and can serve unique profiles of clients or businesses, that makes you far more valuable to that overall relationship. Is that what you're talking about, Ryan? Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of work that can be done there, and especially in the financial advisory space, it's about truly understanding what those client profiles look like. And then again, thinking about the service that you're delivering kind of working backwards and saying, what are the top problems those clients are going to face? How can I solve them? And then how can I also turn that service model into allow room to be proactive about other issues those clients are going to face potentially down the road? And I think thinking about, you know, we use the term sales process, but that's really where you can differentiate when talking with the prospect of, here's what we've constructed. We know this is going to be valuable to you. But again, here's all the other stuff that you probably haven't even thought of that we're already thinking about that you're going to need us for down the road. And we're already there in terms of being able to deliver that to you when the time is right. And you can do that because you understand the client. You know, yeah, exactly. And I, I feel like that's, that's the key, especially even related to things like marketing as well. If you don't know who you're talking to, then you're talking to nobody. Yeah. So it's really about focusing on the specific client profile you're trying to reach. And then again, everything we just talked about, what are we trying to solve for? Where are those clients hanging out? What interests do they have? And really creating kind of a holistic approach, not only for top of prospects, but when they become existing clients, like what type of content is going to be more valuable to them? Yeah. What type of engagement? What type of events? What type of billing methodology? What kind of technology? Thinking through every single step in that client journey for those different segments takes some work, but you know, from there, once you can start to implement that in an efficient way, um, it really can really sing. Yeah, I agree with that a hundred percent. And what, when you're talking to somebody that is still, you know, maybe a generalist or hasn't gone through that process, why do you think that is, or are there some common themes as to why advisors have not taken that, you know, gone through that exercise to, to, do the client profiling and get dialed in on who they're serving? Yeah, there are a few different reasons. I'll say the the number one reason I see is because initially just trying to create a business, yeah. you, you, you want <laughs> revenue that's going to you know feed the family and pay the mortgage, right? And give you some, some room to run in terms of shaping the next step in the evolution of, 
of the firm. So initially it can be a little bit more of a daunting task to say brand new venture here, but this is this is the only profile that I'm serving or maybe a, a small subset of profiles. That just seems like you're not casting wide enough of a net and might limit your potential opportunity set. Actually, the reverse is true. We could talk about that. But what I'm seeing a lot of now is the firms who have hit a certain level of viability and have good uh, revenue are pretty happy with the model that they're delivering, but they know they're delivering their best work to let's say the top 20, 30, 40% of their clients. They're willing to say, hey, I wanna rework some things here. My firm has evolved, my service model is at a point where I wanna spend even more time and energy on these ideal clients because those are the folks that give me the most passion. When I wake up in the morning, those are the folks I wanna talk with. Those are the problems I enjoy serving or solving. So then you can really kind of shift after you've reached that, that viability in the business to say, now I want to be really, really focused on maybe these one or two or three segments. That's well said. I mean, the, the risk management insurance side of the industry is, I think, the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to not take that second step, you know, or that evolution because everybody needs insurance, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, to Ryan's point, we don't control a lot of the revenue that we we receive to a degree. And so I think it just causes uh, that lack of specialization to be easy to continue to do when in reality uh, there's, you know, everything you've mentioned about why it's so important is what can take you to the next level as a firm. But I totally agree with that. I mean, you gotta, when you're just starting out, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. But I think it's important to have an idea of where you wanna go and be, and, and work towards that as quickly as you can, you know, put food on the table, but have that vision of where you're going. Yeah, I think I think that the more laser focused you are, the earlier on in the business venture on who exactly you want to serve. I mean, I can think of firms like like Apple, like Apple came out and stated, we're not for everybody. Right. Yeah. We're this kind of cool, punky tech company. And it's more than just a phone. And they sold kind of that image in that brand. Right. Um, Tesla, Tesla, they're not for everybody, right? Not everybody needs an EV or even likes, you know, yeah. the style of the car, but guess what? Those businesses are successful because they know who they were going after from day one and really messaged the crud out of it and said, you're either with us or against us, but this is what we're really, really, really good at. Well, and there's a lot of people out there. There is a lot of businesses out there, you know, like we've had this conversation over the years of you know we're, we're having this conversation it's like well there's not a there's not just going to be enough of those in nebraska it's like <laughs> number one there probably is but number two we don't just need to work in nebraska <laughs> you know which is where our firm is but you know it, it's all of those things that are limiting beliefs right from people that that are, are mm -hmm. nervous about focusing in that in a direction because of what it could limit and keep them from doing versus what can it allow me to do for those that i'm serving yeah, it's, absolutely. It's crazy that we've been talking a lot about this internally. Just uh, this is happening in every other aspect of our lives because I, I want to touch or revisit something you said, which is that, you know, uh, the vast majority of the revenue usually is coming from a small percentage of clients. And you're, in essence, taking, you know, value away from those uh, top clients that are paying the majority of the revenue to provide a certain experience to the ones that are not, right? Like that's, and so this hit me the other day when Nebraska is putting their just proposed a four hundred and fifty million dollar renovation to the South Stadium, and I don't want to talk about football today, but. Um, <laughs> Let's get into it. Let's yeah. Go. Right. Yeah. Well, we're uh, not very good, Sean. Catch that... me while we're down. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, but we're cutting like 10,000 seats to enhance the experience and we're putting in more box seats and everything else. And I was using it like, guess who's donating the $450 million? Like 250 million of it's coming from like a hundred different people. And they're in essence like catering you cannot have the same seats. You cannot provide the same experience. You cannot provide the same view or vantage point to every single person in the stadium for the same price. You just can't do it. 
And but we, we don't we don't complain. We look at the price of the tickets and we're like, oh, well, I can't afford that one. So I'll take this one. And I know that I'm going to get that with this. So it's like when I think about different analogies like that, it takes me back to it's like we're just not clearly communicating good enough to the client on like what to expect. And then we just can't get out of our own way to actually go out and sit with that client and say, this is the only thing that you're going to get. Or maybe it's not the only thing, but here's here's what you're going to get. For Yeah, who you are. I'm, I'm reminded of a phrase, um, what's fair is not always equal. So somebody who comes in and your example, Ryan has a, a suite and they paid a lot of money for it to watch Nebraska play really, really good football every single Saturday. You know, they're going to get a little bit of a different experience than the folks who within their budget and what they like to do. And maybe it's a tailgate and they've been sitting in, you know, section 240 for 30 years with their family. Like that's a different experience for them, right? They don't pay the same amount as the person who's got, you know, the, uh, the valet parking and they're walking through the heated tunnels and they're going to the AC with the suite and all the food and jazz like that. So the experience is different, but that doesn't mean it's, it's better or worse. It's just, it's equivalent to kind of what they're paying for. Right. So what's fair is not always equal. And I think if financial advisors and in, in my case with who I, I work with quite frequently, kind of get some freedom around that expression and just say, I've got some top clients or I've got ideal clients here or a profile of clients here. Again, they might need a different service model. That doesn't mean one is better or worse. It just means it's relative to what they should be getting at this point in their lives with the complexities they're trying to solve. Have you ever seen anybody lay out options and let a client choose where they're at based upon how much they want to pay? Because sometimes I feel like that would, you know, in the risk management industry, that would obviously get more hairy. But where if you have three different models and they fit in the model where they're going to get a little bit of a stripped down version of what the top clients would receive, you know, but let them choose if they want to pay more then you know, they could certainly get that experience. And then if they don't choose that and they're, they're comfortable and they willingly go into the other option, then like everyone can have peace of mind that like, oh, well, you know, they selected that. That's where they want to be. And that's what that's exactly what we're going to give them. Yeah, I think that is a, a great strategy and actually one that I work on with RAs across the Midwest, just thinking through, again, going back to your point, what are the different service levels that you want to provide? And we see this across all different things, right? You can get uh, Disney Plus or Disney Plus with Hulu and ESPN Plus, like what's right for you? They come at different costs, right? So we're offered all these different options based on our perceived needs. And they have different, you know, every company has kind of different tranches of, of what experience you're going to buy, right? So in the advisory world, you know, really thinking through and showing that client, hey, here's what we're going to deliver based on your situation. I think this is the best experience for you. If the client says, you know, step down or step up if appropriate, absolutely fine. The trouble spot there is then just to make sure that that client isn't kind of going through a scope creep and asking for services that are, let's say, upward in terms of what they're paying for. And they start asking for more and more and more and more. Then you have to have that discussion with the client of, we agreed that this was the model that we're delivering. You're talking about things that are getting in a little bit more complex. And for the time and services and resources that requires, you know, that necessitates a change in fee. So it's just about being willing to have that conversation and educating the client on what they're set to receive and then really making sure you actually are delivering on that. Because the second you then deliver a lot less than what they think they should be getting, mm -hmm. then the question is, well, why didn't I just pay for this lower, let's say, premium package right over here? Yeah. There's a level to that too. And there's a lot of psychology that goes into, mm -hmm. you know, designing those levels to get where to put clients in the service model you want to get them into. Meaning like if you, if you want to get them to the thousand dollar service, you have a $500 service, a thousand and a 2000 because you want them to fall in that middle one most of the time. Um, and there's a lot of, I know I just saw a study about, they went through uh, regardless of the size of drink that McDonald's was offering. The majority of people selected the middle drink, a size regardless if it was big, small and different. Uh, and I think that applies to a lot of things. You know, there's, there's an anchor point that's high that they think, well, that might be more than I need, but I don't want the lowest end. So they go for the middle. I think it's slightly different in uh, our industry, you know, because you're doing a lot of complex 
stuff and, and bringing a lot of different value to the client potentially. But I think some of that still applies and that's more of a marketing technique and a sales technique. But uh, I think that can be beneficial as well with a model like that. Yeah, I think, I think you're right there. Behaviorally, there are different, um, a lot of science has been done in behavioral economics and why people make choices the way that they do some anchoring things like that, different biases uh, that can come into play. But at the end of the day, what I coach advisors on is just making sure that the model that you want the client to get into based on what you know they need and how you can deliver to them will be a valuable experience yeah. should be what you lead with, in my opinion. So sometimes giving too much choice in terms of, well, we can do it this way or that way, but here's the way I think you should do it. And this is what I think is the best offering for you can create some of that confusion. And then in those situations, that's when we see kind of the, the brain locks up in the decision-making process and people become hesitant to lock themselves into one or the other because they don't necessarily know what questions they should be asking. Yeah. So another strategy is, is really as the advisor, and again, that's what they're paying you for is that coaching and guidance is really kind of leading with the firm. This is the model I've built out for people in your situation. This is how we pe help people the best people just like you. Uh, so there's a lot of conviction with that. And I think that conviction can also be quite powerful as well. Yeah, it's great perspective for sure. And yeah, it, it, just to double down on that, you know, in with what we are delivering, um, I totally agree with you. You know, if you're delivering more of a commodity type service or something like that, you know, I think some of those behavioral based type of uh, mm -hmm. nuances are probably much more applicable. Right. So, I, yeah, I think that's spot on. Spot on. Yeah. And just to build on that a little bit further, and we talked about, you know, client experience. And I know you've had Dan Allison on uh, yep. previous episodes with you, and I've known Dan for a number of years. It really, his whole thing comes down to, are you providing an experience that's referable in the first place? Yeah. So if we go back to the idea of generalist versus a specialist, it's harder to get referrals if you're a generalist because your message or your experience might be a little bit diluted. Let's just say the customer isn't getting everything, in, let's say, at 100% efficiency and kind of receiving all that value. The more specialized you are, the more laser-focused you are, and again, who you're serving and how you're going to serve them, that creates a more referable experience because that client or customer is just getting, you know, 100% realization of everything that you're bringing to the table. Yeah. Yeah, so it's true. such a key component. It really I think is. the emotional side of actually driving an experience leads to that, you know, of people are that emotional connection. If they can feel the experience, if they can, you mm -hmm. know, know it's not, they are not equating it just to a financial transaction uh, is going to stick with them a lot longer than, you know, a financial transaction. Um, and so I've kind of gathered a lot of that as you've been talking about when you describe an experience, it's an emotional connection to a degree because they can feel something different when they work with you. The emotional connection drives everything. And then again, even in the risk management world is thinking about what are the other elements of the discussion we can have here that aren't necessarily related to the, the deal itself. You know, again, I talk about financial advisors working with clients on other aspects of their life. Maybe it's health and wellness, things that maybe you wouldn't assume a financial advisor could help you with. But the more you can kind of centralize and say, hey, I've already thought about these issues. They are probably the primary reason you came to me, but I'm aware of them. Yep. I have people I can bring in resources or I have expertise in these areas outside of kind of the core competency you think you're hiring me for. That then adds additional value and that then increases the overall experience as well. Yep. How do you see or what do you see in folks you're dealing with that are really on the, the uh, they're doing the best job at driving an experience. Like what are some unique things that come to mind that you've seen firms doing that, you know, we may not think about when we think about the, the experience around financial services. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of little things that are, you know, again, relationship based and kind of behavioral based um, just as an example, it's just one quick thing that I, I find really good advisors do is they're proactive about finding reasons to celebrate or commemorate a moment with a client. It doesn't have to be related to anything for why they're getting paid from that client, but it's, you know, Hey, 
I know your son just got into uh, University of Nebraska and he's going to be a football player. Congratulations to you. Doing a great yeah. job raising him. Here's a, a sweatshirt, Nebraska dad, whatever the case might be. But doing so just unprompted and saying, hey, yeah. we're thinking about you. Now, that requires the advisor to be listening, taking notes, maybe even using some technology or a, a CRM system or something like that to keep organized and efficient with that. But the more reasons you can find to celebrate and kind of share and some joy with clients or be there for them in times of need, uh, that is, is, I think, again, going back to the idea that relationships drive everything, that's so, so crucial. And, and I think yeah. really impactful, you know, far more than just showing off different you know, technologies and softwares and proposals and things like that. Right. Cause that, that has a certain shelf life. Yeah. That's sweet. Yeah. It shows the, not only the deep relationship, but that personalization that you have in it, you're listening, as you mentioned, I mean, that listening has become such a uh, overlooked trait. I feel like by industry professionals, right? Like we just think we know what the client wants or should want. We're not listening to exactly what they're saying and they can sense that they feel it. You know, it becomes every time you do that, it becomes more of a product. Um, and the more that you're personalizing back to those conversations, you know, the things that you're talking about that just elevates you in their eyes big time. There's a similar like sniff test to uh, Shonda, what you were describing earlier, just to kind of check yourself on this around um, being able to like we know we know that we're not going to be perfect in delivering a service or an experience. Things are going to happen. We're going to mm -hmm. screw stuff up. Like, and I think sometimes we're just so afraid to do that. And one of the reasons why we're afraid to do that is because we don't have that relationship. If we don't have the relationship, then we're scared to death that if we screw something up, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of a good, it's a good test. It's like, okay, so if you screw up big time, you know, do they do they understand that it was an accident and that you do deeply care about them and right. you know can you overcome that or are they like well shit he doesn't know anything about me he doesn't really care about me and they screwed up I'm out. yeah that relationship equity will get you through a lot of speed bumps and hiccups and, and i think in general clients are relatively understanding of those things as you mentioned you know nobody's perfect um, so those things happen, right? Uh, but without that relationship equity, which takes it can take a long time to kind of build up and have that operate in a sustained way. But that's the key. Again, this all goes back to relationships, especially in the financial advisory space. And I think um, in your industry and risk management, again, there's so much that can be addressed inside of the scope of that relationship that that maybe gets overlooked that I think that the industry could kind of start pay paying a bit more attention to, just exactly like in the financial advisory space. I couldn't agree more about that. Yeah. I think the opportunity is bigger in the risk management space than in the advisory space. Well, we're starting, yeah, just starting to see the, and I mean, I know there's been firms doing this for a long time, so I don't want to uh, make it sound like we all are, are transactional, but I think you're starting to see a lot of these conversations happening in the risk management space, which is encouraging. Whereas I think it's been happening in the financial services side of the industry for a long time. And we can take some cues from that. Just like, you know, obviously you have, or you work with folks on a daily basis, just doing this, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's a good point. Up. Yeah. Good. I that's think good everybody point, wins in that too. Right. I mean, clients yeah. are going to get more, yeah. right. They're going to receive more value. Um, and the professionals are going to be able to deliver that value and keep growing great businesses in that way. So again, the better the experience, the more holistic it is. Everybody wins, in my opinion. Yeah, it truly is like a dual approach <clears throat> because I don't want to take away from it. Like there are advisors out there that have done a phenomenal job of creating a relationship with their client. But I hear all the time where like that is the entire value proposition too. Right. So it's like, well, I don't want to move my business. Why? Well, because I've been with Jim for 30 years. Well, what's Jim do for you? Well, I mean, he takes me golfing. Like we we hear that nonstop. And it's like, okay, well, does he do anything in relation to like providing you value for the amount of money you're paying him on an annual basis? Right. Uh, I don't know about that. So it's like, you know, it is a dual approach. You got to provide value 
from a service and experience perspective and relationship equity value, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's that relationship equity we were just talking about in that example you just described. I, I hear that as well. And it was one of those things where you just have to work with that client, kind of provide some education with them on, on really what they should be receiving based on how you perceive their situation and how you'd help them overcome whatever problems or objectives they're working with. Um, and then, you know, sometimes behaviorally decisions won't get made, but yeah. at least you put your best foot forward and said, this is what we're trying to accomplish. We know we can help people just like you. And you hope that, you know, that client sees that and uh, makes the right decision. Yeah, absolutely. You can't, you're not going to win all of them in that case. And sometimes it's frustrating because you're like, damn it, Bob, 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 stop taking them and going golf, Bob, come on. And, uh, but that's, that's been our industry. That's how people have been trained for a long time. So. Yeah. Well, maybe you just uh, take them golfing twice as much as yeah. Bob's doing. Yeah. And, and then you've got that over them. Yeah. And then, then it's all the other stuff you finally get to talk about. Right. So you yeah. never know. <laughs> exactly. Well, hey, man, we've been going for, for a while here. What uh, else just kind of wrap up what we've been talking about? Is there anything that we didn't hit on, you know, from that client experience service perspective that, you know, you want to make sure you're talking about with everybody? Um, you know, a lot of times when we talk about client experience, the the one thing that people will say is, you know, that sounds great, but that's a lot of time and energy and thought and just kind of effort to put into that. Not that they don't want to, because again, they're trying to get to a spot that delivers an exceptional client experience, but yep. how do I manage that? You know, that's always the question. How do I keep all that personalization, but have it done in a scalable and kind of systematic way on the back end? So that is definitely one of those challenges, but that's a, another area that just in working with firms for a number of years, uh, there are a lot of different solutions that are available out there to kind of help think through that. Um, Cause I think the scalability and systematization of your systems and processes, that's really is what going to set you free yeah. so that you can maintain that high degree of personalization and then enhance the experience as we've been talking about today. So lots to think about, but uh, you know, hopefully that's, that's helpful. Oh, extremely. And I know everybody out there is going to get a ton out of this episode. So I appreciate you taking the time to kind of share what you're doing on a daily basis. Um, I know it's been valuable to not only your firm, but a lot of the, the RIAs and us and everybody that works with you guys. So uh, appreciate your time, man. And uh, absolutely. We'll hopefully chat soon. Maybe we'll get out on the golf course. More than Bob would take you for sure. Happy, <laughs> happy to right. do it. And uh, really, really appreciate the time here today with you guys. And Sean's good enough. I think he could uh, accommodate like my score as well. I have to nobody, absorb it now. Yeah, yeah. Nobody can absorb your score. Now I have to be responsible for your experience. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> oh, I have man. confidence in you that you have the ability. That's what I'm saying. I appreciate it. Well, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for letting me join this episode. You got it. Thanks. Talk Sean. soon. Thanks.